Ba, 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 ba. This week on the Eldritch Lorecast, we take a sneak peek at Dragons of Stormwreck Isle, and it is a sneak peek, and James and Sean get a chance to talk about the D&D movie trailer, plus we talk about how to make Monsters of the Week work as a campaign strategy, all that and more right now. everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, the number one podcast in all of the continent. That's right. This is what witchers listen to in Care More and to get them into the mood for fighting monsters. This educational podcast right here. My name's Ben Byrne and I am here as always with Dale Kingsmill, James Hake, Sean Merwin. And Sean, I have to ask you, because you and James were out last week when the big news about the D&D movie dropped uh, last week. If I had a question for you, it would be, what what did you think of when you thought D&D movie? Like, what was your quintessential D&D movie to you before the D&D movie? The problem what is with this question was I lived through the previous D&D movie. Uh, So I already had my hopes way high and then have them horribly dashed. So what came to my mind when I heard D&D movie was the horror of the previous three movies and all of the legal wrangling that had to take place in order to get to the point where we might actually have a D&D movie with a budget more than, you know, than three million dollars or something. Do you have a favorite of those older? Because there's two, isn't there? There's the Jeremy Irons one, there's, which is very famous. Three. And I feel like there's there's three, three of these yes. things. I didn't even watch <laughs> the third one. I didn't bother. Uh, so that that's where my uh, level of anticipation for a D&D movie is. I might even watch this one. Right. Okay. <laughs> Your heart may be ready to love again, but you're not 100% sure. Gotcha. Uh, James Hake, if you uh, thought of a D&D movie before the official D&D movie, which would it be? What was your go-to? It was The Gamers, an indie, an indie film. Who? What was the name of the production company again? I, I met them at Gen Con once, but I regret to say I can't remember who they actually are. Very funny little low-budget indie trilogy, I think. Uh in which I think Monty Cook cameoed in the third one. I thought that was quite delightful. <laughs> um, but uh, it's you know, it's a it's a group of nerds who play D anD D, and that's the that's the premise. And they have this sort of in world, out of world uh, banter where they play the humans IRL playing the game, and they also play as their characters in costume. Um, and you know, it looks like a LARP because it was produced on the budget of a LARP, but it's very fun. <laughs> um, and honestly, that's kind of what I hope for from a Hollywood D movie is that sort of thing. But you know, with a little bit more of that sort of Marvelish quippy banter and a Hollywood budget. And, um, we have the second two, judging by the trailer. Uh, now, all I'm hoping for is that we have the sort of Princess Bride style cutaways, which I have some hope for based on like early cast interviews when they cut back to the table. Like, okay, we, we've had this um, online scuttlebutt lately about the druid shape shifting into an owl bear. <laughs> I'm, my favorite I, discussion. <laughs> my desperate hope is that after that happens in the movie, we'll quickly cut away to the game table and a rules lawyer player will be like, well, um, actually, an owlbear is a monstrosity. I don't think they can do that. And then everyone kind of boos them at the table until they're just <laughs> like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool after all. We'll we'll let her do that. I think I, I've mentioned it before, but one of my favorite, like, one, like, like, quips to what it's actually like to play DD. I have no idea where this originated from. I have no doubt all three of you have heard it before. Was somebody said on Twitter what they want to happen is sort of at the midpoint of the movie, one of the main characters dies and then comes back in the next scene played by the same actor. Um, and, the, and they just proceed like nothing has changed whatsoever. Uh, I think that would be just, just perfect. Uh, Dale Kingsmill, what did you think of before this DD movie when you thought? D&D movie. 
I was kind of swayed by the concept of, you know, um, like I know it's called Honor Among Thieves and they are kind of doing this thing of like, you know, the roguish group who are actually heroic at heart and now they're doing some heroism. And I kind of was uh, along that thread, but I did think that they would be, that they would seem more thievish. Um, I thought that they would seem a, a little, um, a little more, not ragtag. I need a word that's a little bit, a little bit dingier than ragtag, but I feel like you get the concept. Um, more scoundrels? More Scally scoundrels. Wags. That's it. A little bit more Moss Eisley. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, I was going to make a joke last week about the, the D&D movie everyone's been waiting for uh, is getting a remake. That's right. Mazes and Monsters. Uh, a re-release, <laughs> I should say. Um, but I kind of didn't want to dive into it because that, that story gets squirrely if you start to look into it too much and I didn't feel quite equipped. Did you say the squirrely? Yeah, squirrely, you know, like a bit uncomfortable. No, that, but that story isn't gets... it squirrely? I, I don't know, Dale. Um, I'll have to uh, tinker <laughs> with it in the hinkering or something like that. Um, just... <laughs> ben, I'm on your side. Message yeah. received. <laughs> I, just always, no, I just thought that Americans were put, because you, you say squirrel funny. I mean, <laughs> TBH. I mean, just. <laughs> <laughs> this morning the podcast chose violence like we all just came in. How, how do you say squirrel, Dale? Squirrel. I just feel like it's two syllables and you kind of make it one. Squirrel. Yeah, we squirrel. pronounce all the letters. Squirrel. Maybe one and a half at a stretch. Squirrel. Squirrel. <laughs> squirrel. You know, I can't hear uh, I can't hear any squirrel. difference between what you and I squirrel. are saying. But maybe There's that's a just schwa. My... <laughs> there is a whole schwa in there. Squirrel. 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna squirrel. be honest. I I was not associating squirrel. Horrible. And squirrel? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Caramel, caramel. Are we gonna are we gonna scatter some dire squirrels? Can we make this relevant somehow? <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, I mean, druids can <laughs> often wild shape into squirrels, uh, but not not giant squirrels because they might be monstrosities. I don't know. Probably not. Um, well, um, actually, most giant creatures in the monster manual are still beasts, <laughs> so they're available for druids to. <laughs> we've we've got to get we've got to get the rules lawyer Anthony Joyce Rivera, the official rules lawyer. Um, if you've been watching Anthony's TikTok, it is delightful. Um, uh, anyway, all of that aside, uh, we'll Anthony, back- in fact, has written for Ghostfire. You'll be seeing him in episode six of Pirates of the Ethereal Expanse, Ooh. the grand explosive finale when it comes out in December of this year. Mark your calendars. <laughs> well, you've just done the perfect segue for me, James Haig, because I was about to say we'll come back to the D&D movie, but the news, uh, the Ghostfire news of the week is that episode two of Fables 2, uh, Pirates of the Ethereal Expanse, has dropped. What, James, can you tell me about this new episode for those that have been awaiting it or those that might be uh, wanting to jump on board, pun intended? Oh, it's a thrilling thing. Um, This is where the characters finally have their ship and they make their journey towards the pirate haven known as the Isle of Drakes. And uh, it comes with a little bit of new hardware that uh, is absolutely gorgeous, designed by Ghostfire uh, team member Simon Sherry, our sort of chief graphic uh, product designer. And it is a ship sheet, a character sheet for your pirate ship uh, that can track your crew and your ship upgrades and all the things you need to know at a glance for ship combat, the very intense, deep ship combat rules that are included in this fable. And this is where the adventure really starts to open up. It's very sandboxy. There are multiple islands you can go to, multiple characters that you can recruit onto your crew. There's a pirate crew full of druids. There's an island with a volcano. There's a very sort of Mos Eisley-ish island in the heart of it all. Um, this, this is where I would say this fable really begins, especially because it's its first full-length episode, episode one uh is really just a bite-sized introduction and here we go mm. full bore into the story as it starts mm. to begin for you uh reading uh about the isle of drakes because i i ran a little practice adventure using uh the setting of fables it is good fun it, it did start a little bit like you know 
mystic, uh, ethereal sea, uh, a, an ocean of possibility and, and mysteries to be uncovered. And it did end a little bit Rick and Morty with just like, you know, very strange looking characters, but having very normal voices and problems uh, in the world. Um, but I like that, that breadth of uh, ethereal <laughs> expanse in it kind of, you can, you can pitch the tone wherever you want uh, somewhere along there or, or outside of that. Um, I'm also excited for people to, to explore. Uh, what's the main town called at the centre of the Isle of Drakes? Oh, that's Velsterone Island. And the, the tavern there is very detailed and the, there's lots of NPCs. If, if you need advice as a GM uh, for how to do, is it O'Shane is how I've been pronouncing it, the pirate yeah. bard? Yeah, um, O'Shane. Uh, I, I've heard O'Seen as well. Okay. Um, you know, there's a pronunciation guide in this fable. That character's pronunciation escapes me. So go go <laughs> find him in there. He's in there. Uh, you... Go ahead. I'm delighted you bring him up because uh, speaking of Anthony, uh, he oh, that bard is ultimately very important in the finale of this adventure. So I think as a GM, it's worth uh, keeping Oshin in mind for sort of like uh, seeding his presence and making him a pal to the characters kind of on the sidelines before... Uh, it all comes to a head at the very end. We should talk about that. That's interesting. I didn't say I, I haven't read ahead uh, in fables uh, yet, but when we're not on the air, uh, you and I should talk about that because that's interesting. <laughs> if as a GM you need to find the voice of O'Shane, uh, go check out the Fables 2 cinematic trailer. Cole McGuinness yes. does this excellent where we're constantly walking around the office just saying sea of starlight to each other <laughs> um, constantly. Um, and I think I know all the lyrics to that song just about. So check out the trailer for that uh, and check out Fables 2 Parts of the Ethereal Expanse. Chapter 2 is out now. Um, uh, the sailing has officially commenced. Um, and then in more general news, uh, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to look at it yet. I'm not sure if any of you have had a chance to get a copy of it yet. Uh, but Dragons of Stormwreck Isle uh, has officially gone on sale. People are busting it open and having a look at its contents. I just watched some YouTube kind of unboxing slash review looks at it last night. So I've got kind of a basic working uh, uh, understanding of it. Sean, have you had a chance to look at this yet? My copy arrives in the mail tomorrow. So. Uh, Dale James, have either of you had a chance to look at it? No, I have I've not. been dreadful. I'm just, well, I'm just curious down about. To bed. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> curious about those uh, '80s cartoon characters on the front, right? It's the it's the archer and the thief acrobat from the '80s cartoon dodging dragon breath on the front, and I'm really curious to know what they're doing there, how they play into all this. Yeah, I'm uh, no no review that I saw of it, and admittedly, I wasn't watching hours of it. It was sort of I took. 20 minutes, maybe half an hour to quickly watch through a few videos. Nobody mentioned it. I think the pre there's five pregens and one of them is an archer fighter uh, is the class that they went with. Um, so I'm not sure if that like plugs in or not. I assume maybe it does because I think it's like fighter, archer, rogue, paladin, wizard, and something I can't remember. But that's that's basically the party from the animated cartoon. If it's right? a cartoon cast, it would be barbarian. That's the last one. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, and unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It, it looks interesting. I mean, a lot of the the initial stuff that I hear people saying about it is that it is an extremely well, uh, it's an extremely good resource for new game masters specifically. Um, it's got a 33 or uh, 30 page rule book, which is just basically a lot of the stuff from the player's handbook ported in. Um, interestingly, somebody thought it didn't have character creation rules, which I don't know. Like I didn't really look through Fandelva or, um, I spy peak to know, like to know what the comparisons are here. Um, but with those pregens that are pretty well fleshed out, including character backstories, um, maybe you don't need character creation quite at that point. I mean, it's a tricky question, right? Because a lot of the fun that comes from a tabletop RPG is creating your own character. But at the same time, if you're trying to, um, you know, give the rules of D&D to someone in a, in a helpful little morsel that's not going to freak them out, the easiest thing that you can cut out is character creation, which can be very confusing for a new player. I feel like we've talked about this before. What's the best way to teach new players the game? Is it with character creation or is it with pre-gens and diving right into the game? 
And mm-hmm. it seems like Wizards has made a choice here. It, you know, they're going to use that method of getting people into the game and take more time to teach the DMs how to best DM the game. Uh, I that's why I'm waiting to read this. I want to see if that if the the adventure itself goes a little further than the other adventures have in doing a step by step um yeah, you know, un- unfolding of the rules for the DM. Is that is it this different from Lost Minds? Did Lost Minds include like any sort of character creation rules? I can't remember. Or was it just literally the adventure book? That's all I feel that was basically was the adventure book with maybe a little bit of rules at the front. There were character creation rules, I believe, in the initial starter set. Uh, there were pre-gens as well, but I think there there were the rules that would allow you to create characters. A limited number of characters. Uh, just the four main classes and four, uh, I think four, uh, races, but not, you know, not the full breadth of it. What are the, what are the four main classes? Uh, fighter, rogue, wizard, which is the fourth in this, in this pantheon of classes? Cleric, fighter, rogue, wizard, cleric. Ah, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. That's fair. I was just curious. Yeah, I've never, yeah. like, I've always heard it like, you know, support, DPS, tank. Um, you know, fighter, sneaky, roguey person, um, you know, oh, healer. I guess healer, healer. Yeah, yeah. okay, fair, fair enough. <laughs> Played too much Overwatch, not enough. Wow, uh, I guess is the, <laughs> the answer to that. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks like it does have a lot of help for the for the game master in the adventure module just from the flick through that I saw. Um, but I feel like Lost Minds did as well. It was sort of like, you know, this is what you might want to do if the party go past the wagon and they ignore it, or this is what will happen if they decide to go uh, and follow the trail that the adventure sort of lays out for them. Whether it's more than that, I don't know. But the thing I will say is that the book looks a lot nicer um, the stat blocks at the end of Lost Minds of Fandelva were very kind of like they are at the end of the DMG, where it's just like, you know what a cow looks like, you know what a wolf looks like, you know, like you don't need art for these things here as X, Y, Z kind of monsters. Whether as this looks more like something at the end of, uh, you know, a full adventure module book where you've got the stat block, maybe a piece of art, but it's much more nicely laid out, uh, much more kind of defined what the stat blocks are. I feel like they... If they didn't put in a link to a video showing people a playthrough of this, they've missed out on a big opportunity because that is the next step, right? That's the next step in teaching people how to play. Go here and watch us translate what's these words on this page to a game, and then you can too. They knew that even with the original starter set. You know, there was no link, but really early on, uh, even... I think it was even pre-critical role. Greg Billsland, then of the D and D team, was running an office stream of Lost Minds of Fandelver. I, I hope I'm not just like spoiling it here for you, Sean, and spoiling your joy of uh, opening it tomorrow. Uh, they do include a, a whole host of links and things. Um, the reason I didn't initially mention it was because they, it, it, I. I I don't know. Maybe I missed it, so I could be wrong about this, but I didn't see any sort of link to, like, D&D Beyond or any kind of hook-in like that. Um, Again, I could have missed it, but there was definitely, like, links and a QR code to, like, you know, look at this video, check out this. It was, like, a whole host of them um, that I assume is on the the Wizards of the Coast or the Dungeons & Dragons YouTube channel um, that those are linking to. Adventure seems cool. It's got dragons in it. It's got more than one dragon, uh, as hinted by the... uh, Isle of Storm, Storm Break Dragon Sun. I can't remember what the name of it is. Anyway. The Isle of Storm Sorry. Break Dragon Sun. <laughs> I'm, I'm mixing fables <laughs> and uh, Storm Break Isle in my head uh, together. It's all just. The squirrely dragon. The squirrely <laughs> dragons. <laughs> Stormbreak Isle, that's what it's called, right? Dragons of Stormbreak Isle. Yeah. There, I think it. it's I think it's Stormwreck Isle. It's right, Stormwreck yes. Isle? Storm oh Storm no, Wreck. this is so much worse than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Last bit of news, quick bit of news here. Uh, kind of not D&D related, but I just wanted to shout this out because I saw this on Twitter um, and it wasn't covered by any of the sort of news websites I usually go, go to for D&D news which surprised me a little, but I suppose it's because R. Talsorian, uh, the tabletop RPG publisher responsible for such hits as The Witcher tabletop RPG game, uh, but also doing Cyberpunk Red um, and I think Cyberpunk 2020 are two separate um, role-playing systems from what I could see. I was perusing their website last night. They have 
been doing what looks like actually a fair bit of support for the Witcher role-playing game, which you might think might have been a bit of a one-and-done kind of like here's this tie-in to the video game sort of thing. But there's, I think, about four or five different supplements out for that uh, at the moment. But in addition to that, what they've been doing is releasing uh, what they're calling DLC, which I think is very cute because, um, well, I guess it is literally downloadable content because you get it from their website. But it's also obviously a pun, I would assume, on uh, the video game downloadable content term, uh, which are free PDFs that are on their website uh, that you can just download. And they're a couple pages long and they add extra content to the game. The latest one of those that they're adding um, is called Witcher uh, Prosthesis and Wheelchairs. Um, kind of bringing in uh, prosthesis and wheelchairs as part of the the RPG world um, and as character options that uh, players can choose for their Witcher and or I assume other characters as well. Um, and I just thought that was kind of cool. Uh, not only that they're continuing to support this game, which is just kind of quietly trucking along in the background, uh, but also that they would uh, do a supplement uh, somewhat like this, which they've also did an earlier one as well, uh, something about medicine on the continent, I think it was called. Moving right along, uh, the D&D movie trailer. <laughs> All right, James and Sean, we need to get your thoughts on this. Uh, it's very can important. Can a druid turn into an owl bear? Uh, James, go fight. I think I've made. I think I've made my opinion very clear. And uh, it's if the table agrees, they can. They can. Okay, that's fair. Uh, James, for the for the rebuttal or the c- confirmation? Yeah, James. Well, I will rebut what <laughs> I say. Oh, and I, will say I, think that, <laughs> I think that it should be played by the book. <laughs> this is like, it got cut out. It was on the, the stream, but it got cut out of the final podcast. But I called Monty, I almost called him Monty Merwin last week <laughs> because I was just. Just out of habit. Was, yeah. <laughs> Just names seem to confound me. Uh, what I meant to say was Sean uh, for the confirmation. Everyone's a Merwin. Monty Merwin, <laughs> James Merwin. Uh, Sean, you appear to be muted. Muted Merwin. <laughs> muted Merwin. It's, I generally sound better that way, but I said <laughs> I, I'm going to actually change my name to Monty now because that's really Monty Merwin. That's, that's cool. Uh, I like that. Uh, in terms, in terms of the rules, do whatever is fun for the table. Just understand when you change the rules what it might mean. If you're letting a first level druid or a second level druid shape change into an owl bear, the owl bear is going to wreck your campaign uh, and, until you get past that because that's a very powerful monster for a very low level uh, adventure. But other than that, have have fun. Do do what you're going to do. Uh, and it's a, it's a movie, so they can do whatever they want in the movie, uh, and I'm okay with it. Uh, Sean, was there something specific, like when you watched that trailer, I assume that you've watched that trailer, um, uh, was there something specific that kind of jumped out at you, something you got really excited for, something you were like, hey, wait a minute, that's not how that should work, or do you feel like this is kind of fulfilling that role of the, the quintessential D&D movie that we pontificated upon for a few months? The the only thing I was really focused on when I watched it originally was what's the production value look like? Mm. Does it look like they are going all in with the graphics and and you know with the way the scenes are set up? And it looks like they are. I'm happy. It could it could make no sense whatsoever. It could totally destroy the D and D rules. I'm all good with it. It's okay. It's a D and D movie. I want to eat popcorn, slug back some some pop. And uh, and have fun. Yeah, I feel very much the same. Um, I I think any nods to the way that D and D works will be cute and fun for for all of the D and D fans in the audience, myself included. Um, in fact, in the trailer, it looks like there's kind of this magic maze that springs up. All of these sort of square pillars rising from the ground, which does seem to create a, a square grid dungeon for these people to run around. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's very cute. Um, I think it's a delightful nod to grid based combat but like it doesn't have to be anything more than that um you know the 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 point of the DD movie is to cinematically show us kind of what we all imagine our campaigns to be like in our mind's eye all of these rules they're they're here to fulfill other needs gameplay fun needs things like that movie doesn't need to worry about them too much so there's this there's this thing that um 
I think was really clever about early MCU movies, Marvel movies, uh, well, specifically from the cinematic universe. It, it all gets complicated because there's so many different versions. But um, <laughs> so you kind of see a trend uh, throughout cinematic franchises um, that around sort of the early 2000s, there was sort of this thing of wanting to pull people into multimedia by forcing them not to understand stuff, right? Like you watch the um, the Matrix sequels and they have direct references to stuff from the Animatrix or even from the video games. Right. And you won't understand that part of the movie really very well unless you have gone and consumed that additional media. And once we hit the, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we started seeing um, a shift away from that into something that was just rewarding people who knew some of this other stuff rather than punishing people who didn't. It's like, here's a little treat for you, the comic book fans, that you get an extra little buzz. Um, but anyone who hasn't read the comics still gets to have a good time and have a coherent story and everything's, you know, fun and good. And I uh, am very hopeful that that's the kind of thing that we'll see in, in the D&D movie, that it'll just be a good fun time good fun fantasy movie but if you've played dnd there will be little references for you that you get and you get to feel special this the more i look at it and also focusing on the, the cgi monsters a fair bit because they're kind of what caught my eye i, I underestimated how cool it would look to see a, a displacer beast or a mimic or whatever it happens to be kind of animated and moving around the mimic in particular was a lot of fun um but it kind of reminded me of the pokemon movie a little bit um, just in terms of like, if you're a fan of Pokemon and seeing like a Greninja jump around and like act like a ninja, I was like, that's sick. Like you never see that thing really move. Um, uh, even in a Pokemon video game, like a ninja. Seeing the um, little so- Bulbasaur waddle in Detective Pikachu. Right. That's, right? that's it. So- I can die happy now. <laughs> <laughs> and weirdly, Justice Smith is in both those movies, so maybe that's the maybe he's the the through line. We're just there. this podcast Pokemon. is becoming a Justice Smith, um, you know, appreciation <laughs> hour. Just these last two weeks, I feel I feel that's true. the The Justice Smith uh, cinematic universe uh, is real. D and D and Pokemon occur in the same universe. Confirmed. Yeah, I don't know. It looked cool. It uh, it got me excited. I think you're right, Dale. It does. Uh, I think they've probably seen like Guardians of the Galaxy um uh you know avengers and probably something like the pokemon movie and thought yeah all right now we're ready now we can do a dnd movie um that's going to be really good and i think it's no accident that this also isn't following in the footsteps of game of thrones like so many other fantasy tv shows are trying to do right now in this admittedly completely my aesthetic but i understand not everyone's dead serious everything sucks like how are we going to defeat this great evil uh kind of uh atmosphere we have seen exactly two minutes of of a movie so all the people that i've talked to are like oh it's all silly it's it's totally silly there's nothing serious about it it's the first trailer it's two minutes there may be more depth to it than the two minutes we saw there could be lots of things that uh, we get to focus on and it's generally the case that the people who make the movie don't cut the trailers mm. uh the people that you know the the marketing people are the ones that are going to be cutting the trailers mm. so they're focusing on a specific target to do a specific thing and i think they did a great job of doing that by putting in all the easter eggs for the D D players while at the same time showing that this could be a fun movie with all the stars that are in it. Somebody mentioned on Twitter there was a take which I quite liked, uh, which was the tone seems to be, and I think they were referencing specifically the Red Wizards, um, which when I saw those in the trailer, I was like, A, that's super cool, and B, I'm proud of myself for knowing what that is because I'm not a huge Faerun person, but I was like, I know that's a, I know that reference. Um, but it was like... The D&D movie has the perfect tone, or appears to, because uh, you're right, Sean, it is only two minutes of the whole thing, but it seems to to hit that perfect tone of the party, the, the, the protagonists, taking everything very tongue-in-cheek, while the villains, a.k.a. the game master, takes everything dead seriously. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's kind of like how can the 
the player characters come in? How can the cast come in and kind of ruin the plans of the the head villain in the the most spectacular uh, ways possible? Um, the one thing that interested me actually, seeing the Red Wizards, and now this is just uh, plot uh, nerdy plot speculation, was if the Red Wizards are in it, and they seem to be in it a bit. Uh, judging by the trailer, but that could be wrong. It could be just like an opening uh, act or something like that. And Hugh Grant was meant to be the villain, but they've made a specific reference to Hugh Grant's character being a rogue uh, in correlation with the rest of the party, having, the, you know, the barbarian, the paladin, the the bard. Is Hugh Grant actually the villain or is Hugh Grant like a, a an early, like a, a a a villain that turns i've heard some early talk and i don't know if this is confirmed or speculated or what that hugh grant is going to be playing daggled never ember lord of neverwinter the same daggled never ember who in waterdeep dragon heist absconded with half a million gold pieces after embezzling it from waterdeep's treasury um and then failed to recover it uh as goes on the course of that adventure so it seems like he is going to be this very sort of posh noble who is deeply, deeply roguish in his true heart. If if he is, because I remember you saying that a couple of weeks ago, or months ago now, probably. Um, would you? Would you? What is the James Hake preference that he is like absolute villain heel turn? Uh, you know, back and forth, but ultimate villain, or that he kind of becomes part of the party at the end and we have a, a chance to see more of him in a are you hoping for the locification or the jokerification of never ember where he just becomes this like recurring thorn in the side of the party well, that's a really good question because you know i don't think i really know very much about lord never ember uh, he, he's really a backstory player in Waterdeep Dragon Heist. His son is more of a player in that actual adventure than he is, Renair Never Ember. Um, and so I don't know. It, it kind of depends on what the nuance of that character is. Because if he's like actually a good guy at heart and just kind of a, a scoundrel to do well by his people, then I'd be like, yeah, okay, cool, bring bring it in. But if he's if he's just sort of a jerk and a nasty, underhanded politician, then I'm like, well, you're really going to have to do some work to endear him to me, if mm. uh, if you want him to to be a good guy in the end. Sure. And I'm down for either way, just because I don't really know anything about the character as he's going to be in the movie. I think if you look at it in terms of a normal D&D campaign story, we know in the trailer, I'm going to spoil the trailer if anyone's not seen it. No, they say we stole this, we stole this item. And then it turns out it was more powerful than we had thought. And it could bring about the end of the world. So if we fit it into that sort of story framework, probably the, the character that Hugh Grant plays is in the middle, right? He's that middle person who, Maybe he's the one who hired them to steal the thing. And then he passed it on to the Red Wizards, not knowing what he was doing. And that gives him that. Hopefully, if it's the world will end, if we carry through with this, he will come out on the side of good. But then maybe even in the end, try to make money off of it. Or, so, you know, that's sort of the the trope you would expect from that sort of character. Mm. We'll see if that plays out. Um, we have a, a character who recurs at my game table. Um, though I don't know if he's ever been in a campaign I've run because it's one of my friends who plays him and he's shown up in a bunch of different campaigns. His name's Snick Chop and he's a half-orc rogue who was originally a play on Bricktop from the movie Snatch. Um, and <laughs> basically the running gag in our group over the course of a couple of years has been he is... He is pure chaos embodied and he constantly does heel turns and back to hero turns back and forth throughout the whole campaign completely unpredictably where he'll be like, all right, I've stolen the item from the rest of the party and I'm going to run away now. Ha ha ha. And then it's like all the town guard rock up and he's like, oh, I'm defenseless. Um, I need your help. Can you guys help me get out of this? And it sort of goes back and forth like that where you like, if you need to go rescue a person, go grab a MacGuffin. You almost can't let him anywhere near it. Otherwise, uh, something bad will happen. And that's that's kind of what I would, would love to see Hugh Grant's character become is just this, like, oh, like love to hate him, hapless, don't want him around, but, but would love to see him around um, uh, sort of character that recurs throughout uh, 
the 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 D&D uh, uh cinematic universe I I have no doubt may unfold if this movie is successful. Um speaking of I am a little surprised that there is no involvement from Vecna in the D&D movie as far <laughs> as we've seen so far. It seems like uh, and I, I, you know, I know this movie's been in production for a long time, but it seems like the perfect sort of synergy, given that we know the Stranger Things people were in touch with Wizards of the Coast regarding using Vecna in their latest season, that D&D wouldn't try to be like, all right, you think you've seen Vecna? Here's Vecna! And just try and pull a hat trick on him like that. <laughs> this is how, and I think I've said this in an earlier episode, but this is how that's going to go is that the Red Wizards, defeated at the end, will uh, be standing somewhere in some amorphous, uh, evil lair-looking place, and they'll say something to the effect of, to to attack Faerun, the mortal realm, is, is folly. They are far too powerful. And then you'll just see, like, a dude with a skull face and only one eye turn around and just kind of grimace or smile in some way. Um, and you'll be like, ah, and I feel like Beckner's the Thanos of the D. Can I admit mm-hmm. a thing right here, right now on this podcast, in this safe space? Yeah. I don't know who the Red Wizards are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the audience surrogate again. I'm the person who doesn't get the extra thrill because I don't know what's going on. <laughs> don't. Do not feel bad. Like I said, I, I only do very tangential. Like it's lucky. It's that one bit of lore that I happen to know. In the Forgotten Realms, there is a land known as Thay. Thay is ruled by the Red Wizards. It's a majocracy. Um, and at the top of the, the ladder or at the top of the pyramid of Thay is a lich named Zas Tam. And so the Red Wizards go out into the world Creating and selling magic items, that's their, that's their cover, but they're really always plotting whatever Zest Ham is up to, they're involved. And so they're supposed to be sort of this secret organization that y- you think is bad, but you don't ever really know how bad they are. And there's necromancy and there's all sorts of horrors behind the scenes okay. with them. And they've all got tattoos on their heads. They've got a big thing for tattoos. They're like a yeah. they're magical in some way. Okay. I, I had always been given the impression, and again, this is from only very basic reading, that the Red Wizards as an as an like Thay as a nation asked the question about how evil is necromancy if it's just reanimating bodies, which I feel is like, you know, like bodies for labor, you know, there's no soul in them anymore. You're not torturing anybody. It's just their, their physical meat put to labor to build great pyramids and, and, you know, things like that. Is that actually ethically corrupt or not? Um, which is perfect timing, uh, considering in terms of the, 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 the discourse, considering necrobotics, necrobotics. Uh, has just become a thing in the real world, um, which is terrifying. Um, and absolutely in 20 years, Amazon is going to use necrobotics in their, their factories oh, to, no. to have people walk around and deliver packages. Oh, no. You know what's terrible about that, just real quick, is that it's like, it, we can have our questions about what's moral about that, blah blah blah. But at a certain point, you have to you have to admit that maybe it's more moral than having alive humans work in those conditions. Right here, here we go. <laughs> Crack open this this ethical can of. I don't think we should. I think we should fold it back. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it back to the Red Wizard is before it, we get too sidetracked. Is it here. a can? Is it yeah. a can of animated worms? Well, that's <laughs> the question. <laughs> Necrobotic worms. Well, that's just, it's just, it's hilarious to me because necromancy, uh, I think rightfully so for my own sort of storytelling thematic reasons, is often presented as evil inherently. Um, and the Red Wizards, again, just from my very brief reading, seemed to uh, open this quandary further and be like, is it? Is it evil if it's just, you know, and then I never expected this to be something that would need to be answered in the real world, only in a and d campaign. And yet uh, here we are. Um, uh, what, what, a, what a time to be alive. Um, if you are not really familiar with the Red Wizards, Dale, or any of the audience whom she represents. <laughs> <laughs> you are me. <laughs> um, 
there are two 5e adventures that have been published that you can look at to get a sense of them and i think the most robust one is dead in thay which is included in tales from the yawning portal um, it's a mega dungeon, so if that's not your speed, you might want to read it rather than running it, but it does involve some dealings with red wizards, and you do kind of bust into their their secret Bond villain underground lair in order to do some stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, they do make an appearance in the very first 5e adventure, Tyranny of Dragons. Um, they're kind of... Uh, shaking hands with the devil when it comes to Tiamat is rising. We need all the help we can get. Well, let's take a brief excursion to Thay. I think a Thayan ambassador shows up at the Council of Waterdeep and you take a little teleport journey, you know, a thousand miles away to their homeland. And uh, it, it's a very brief segment. It's a, it's like a conference room sort of situation, where you, but like there's this really intense piece of art that I think Com- communicates the Thay vibe better than like any of the any of that actual scene does because you see these there's this guy in like a stasis tube and like tentacles are are prying his arm open and like there's a dozen red wizards kind of like spying on him and taking notes about like what this horrible thing is doing to their test subject and it's like it's like renaissance painting level of a bunch of different figures and weird little poses that is just extremely villainous um, and that, like, that's the Red Wizard vibe in a nutshell. That one art Very piece, cool. And even better to bring it back to Ghostfire Gaming, Dead in Thay was written by Scott Fitzgerald mm-hmm. Gray, who has worked on the last two projects that I have worked on, including Aurora. So he was a big part of that. So hey, hey there mm-hmm. we go. All comes together. The the DNA of uh, that's right D and D writers crossing over. Um. I don't know. I don't know why I felt the need to pontificate something there. Um, uh, Probably because we're coming into a segue. And that segue is that we should pontificate on this listener uh, YouTube comment, actually. I was Mm -hmm. about to say email. If you do want to email the podcast, podcast at ghostbygaming.com. You can get in touch with us there, submit a question. Uh, Come watch live on uh, Twitch on Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, if you want to uh, ask questions there as well. So Twitch chat that are watching, feel free to jump into the conversation as you have been doing. Um, this question coming from Callum on YouTube. Um, oh, and if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can comment down below and I will read through it. How to avoid episodic uh, slash monster of the week style games from getting tired slash dull in format. Um, uh, when I first started reading this question, I, I thought it was going to be how to stop doing monster of the week style games but it's more how do you do Monster of the Week style games but not allow that format to get tired and boring uh, as as they ask. Uh, Dale Kingsmill. So my opinion uh, is vague and evocative, which (laughs) is not necessarily um, the easiest to implement, but uh, I take a lot of my inspiration from film, TV, um, sort of narrative structures that, uh, everyone in the West tends to be kind of steeped in from, from birth. Maybe not every single person. The Amish are probably, uh, chilling, but, um, you know, we, we all kind of have these stories baked into us. And, um, I think that when you watch episodic monster of the week television, the thing that really sort of pulls it through, um, threads it together is, character um you need to leave a lot of room for uh character moments um interpersonal relationships and the growths and difficulties and triumphs therein um and i mean something that is slightly easier to implement is probably also um make sure that the big bad gets more than one episode right i i mean again this is me beating my drum of shorter campaigns um but you know if you if you can kind of follow the the shape of a seasonal arc, you end up with kind of a a stretch of episodes towards the end where you're dealing largely with, um, even if they are different, different bad guys or different monsters, it's all leading up to the one big bad that you have to deal with at the end. Um, But no, I think a lot of it is going to be finding space to let your players have social interactions, which can be hard because monster of the week groups can often also be groups who just want to kill stuff. To to piggyback on what Dale said, which was absolutely true, uh, make make 
uh, a setting in which the characters can always return to and have interactions that take the place of a big, long, ongoing plot. The the Monster of the Week games, the episodic games, that's what they're lacking, right, is that pl- week to week to week, an ongoing soap opera type of dramatic plot. So you have to shorten that. You have to shorthand that into NPCs they can interact with week to week, episode to episode. Um, but the whole reason you run a Monster of the Week episodic type campaign is for a specific reason because it's very manageable. You can have characters drop in and out without missing too much. Uh, so it's important then that the monsters that you use, you change up or, you know, run run a very mystery based one week and then the next week make it sort of a uh, a comedy type situation that's the the theme is what you need to then fall back on to to create different experiences so it's not like the the TV show bones back in the day where you knew that the second person that they questioned was the person who actually did it in the end and it happened week after week after week after week and yet that show was very popular in its time because it did that because people knew that so if your players are there for that episodic feel because they like it then don't mess with it then just give them that thing that they like and and go with it that's incredibly well said and I think a great example of a TV show that will uh, have you in that headspace is Star Trek. Um, there's a place you go back to every week, the Enterprise or Deep Space Nine or wherever. There's a large cast of characters, larger than you could like focus on in the entirety in a single session, single episode. Uh, you know, in in a Star Trek, it's a especially the original series. Kirk is very much the main character, but I think if you look at the Next Generation. The captain is not necessarily the main character of that show. There are plenty of episodes to focus on just Worf or just Jordy or just Deanna and the other kind of the other cast members, the other crew members play as their supporting cast for an episode that focuses on them. And uh, I, I, I think there's something actually interesting to be said for having characters be able to play multiple different characters over the course of a campaign like that, where you kind of get to see uh, things from different people's perspectives, and then they kind of go into NPC mode when they're not in the spotlight. That really that can really reinforce the feeling of, mm-hmm. hey, this is a living, breathing place, and it's time to... F- and like a lot of different things are happening to a lot of different people, and you can kind of hop between the many different stories that they're having over the course of however long it is. Um, another TV show that's really good for this kind of Monster of the Week style thing is uh, Supernatural. Um, literally, hmm. it's a Monster hmm. of the Week. Um, but the early seasons <laughs> of Supernatural were really cool for presenting you a mystery and then slowly revealing through the brothers' research what that monster, pardon me, what that monster uh, is. They're sort of, you know, a modern uh, prototypical witcher, you know, in terms of like, Somebody's died in a mysterious way or some sort of some mysterious happenstance is happening. And now we're going to use our detective skills to kind of uh, nut out what exactly is going on here. And I think that there's a lot of fun in being presented with a, a, a strange situation and then trying to discover what that monster is each time and the fun of going, oh, this is a ghost. I love ghosts. Or, oh, this is like fae spirits. Okay, I thought it was a ghost, but but I can see how this is actually something completely different or whatever it happens to be. But then you can also vary it up and it doesn't, like not every week has to be a mystery necessarily. It can be like, yeah, there's a wyvern up in the tower on the edge of town who's making it hard for caravans to get through. Go and kill that thing. Um, you know, and and so it can be much more straightforward and the preparation becomes about what sort of wyvern is it? Does it have poison or acid coming from its tail? Is it, how many hit points does it have based on, is this like some sort of, you know, royal wyvern or is this a lesser wyvern, you know, type thing? And you can really play with what the monster is um, to to get the players to really engage with how they're going to defeat it. Yeah. Um, and the easier the monster is to defeat based on their research, the better it will feel for the players as they go, hell yeah, we basically one-shot that thing because we found the Death Star exhaust port. Uh, there's an Eldritch Warcast throwback <laughs> for you. Go ahead, James. I think uh, it can be tempting 
for GMs to try and create an overarching plot in their Monster of the Week storyline. A lot of TV series do this. You know, in Deep Space Nine, it will start off the season with a big plot event. It will remind you of the major plot going on somewhere in the middle, and then it will cap off a season with a resolution to the big plot. And everything in the middle, there will be like some episodic stuff that every now and then kind of references a big plot, but doesn't focus on it. That is all well and good for a TV show. But you have to be really, really, really careful in doing that in a D&D campaign because if there's a major threat, the characters will kind of want to handle it immediately and efficiently, <laughs> I find. Um, they don't like having danger hanging over their heads. It's like, well, why would we just kind of wait and let the villain do her own thing when we could go get her now? Mm. Like, surely the problem would be less bad if we just handled it now. Um and so uh, if you plan on doing that, you will have to contrive reasons why they can't. And if your players are particularly uncooperative, uh, which I say with, you know, no, no judgment in any way, uh, they will find ways to circumnavigate your contrivances and they will be annoyed by them because they're like, stop stopping us from doing the thing we wanted to we, like you set up a villain let us get it so okay here's here's where it gets interesting right i said that i take inspiration from from things like television i would be remiss not to mention buffy the vampire slayer by the way if we're talking about monster of the week and how to keep a, a story going even though you are doing heavily episodic stuff um one thing that buffy does that i think could be useful and a million tv shows do it that could be useful to implement in your game is when you are introducing the idea of, oh, there is some kind of undercurrent, some evil plot going on underneath all of this, have it be a cutaway scene. Your players can know about it, but your characters don't. That's a that's a really simple thing to implement, to be like, oh, after credit scene, here's something that's happening, and ooh, the darkness is rising. Actually, Matt Colville did this a bunch in Dusk, where he would just write these these things. We'd finish a game. We'd all be like, yeah, we're ready to do this cool, heroic, whatever. And then he'd write up a, a short story about what the villains were doing and planning and talking about. And we knew about it and were terrified, but our characters <laughs> couldn't do anything about it because they don't know, you know, that, that can be really fun to play with. I was also just trying to look up uh, and I was unsuccessful. You know, I love to throw out the name of like a philosopher and give you their sort of input on the, on the thing. But I can't remember who said this. Um, I think it might have been, I don't know, Louise Darson, who's an academic, uh, or, or maybe Chaim Perelman. I don't quite remember. It was someone, it was an academic talking about, um, I think, early modern drama. And they had a, a really interesting thing to say about um, the joy of stories that you already know the shape of them. This this ties back into what Sean was saying about procedural shows that were really popular, right? You there is there is a joy in I think the quote is something like, um, "There's an ongoing game and you know the rules." So when you when you engage in that story, even though you know what's happening, you know what's going to happen, you know what's going to come, you know who the villain is. It, there is still joy in that and that there is joy in little changes from that formula, even if the overall shape stays the same. And that is something that you can absolutely rely on in a, in a Monster of the Week style game is if the players enjoy that shape of a story, they're going to enjoy that shape of a story. Never was there a tale of more woe than of Juliet and her Romeo. People like kind of knowing what's, what's going to happen. Mm. Sometimes it's good not to challenge expectations. I, uh, I I do like the the advice of the 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 uh, off screen scene or the the post credit scene or the it's kind of random in the first Mass Effect. There's this scene early on where Saren, uh, the main villain of that uh, first one, is being told some news and he gets real angry and cuts sick and throws some things around. And nothing like that ever happens again in any of the other Mass Effect uh, video games that I can remember. Maybe a few cutaways to like some collectors or something like that. But I, that always stuck in my mind as this like slightly odd thing. I constantly, if we're talking about uh, admissions of things, to ensure that I'm not metagaming too much, um, I think I even gave this advice at one point earlier on the podcast or in a video write down what my villains would know about the party and write down what they don't know and then revise that list every now and again um, So as the campaign unfolds. 
And then, you know, in my own time, in my own role-playing way, I'm having a shower or I'm like, you know, walking around my office, literally speaking out loud to myself. My partner's always telling me, what are you doing in there? As I'm like pretending to be a dragon going, they've done what? I will unleash on a fury that they will, you know, trying to ro- literally role-play and decide what Very the Rita Repulsa, very do. Lord Zed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but doing those at the table, like letting the players see that that interaction um, could also be a good way of doing like a, a, a hidden villain, you know, um, which often if you hide your villain too well, if they're, if they're too the, the man behind the curtain, the players don't get a sense that they're fighting against anything. They're just confused. If you say this mysterious person is like over here and you you see them doing some mysterious thing that you know links back to the campaign in X way, um, might give that one a, a, a whirl. Go ahead, Sean. In the game Dungeon World, which is a, a takeoff on Apocalypse World, they have a, a concept called fronts. And what fronts are are just forces that are going on and you can keep track of those as the game master. And if the players move in one direction, the front that's in the other direction will move forward. And that's one of those places where you can, as the game master, say, because they have not moved in this direction in a while, I'm going to describe what's happening along this front. Uh, The evil necromancer, since I haven't thrown any undead at them in a while, this evil necromancer has now taken over this village. And that's going to be the next episode. So next week on monster of the week game and that's what we're talking about here with you know using uh the the tactics of tv to uh, enforce your game stories yeah absolutely i love that sean i i think we talk a lot about doing a previously on when doing a game i don't think we have fully explored the power of next week on (laughs) because some of my favorite shows my favorite like anime from the 90s always ended their credits with and next week on dragon don't forget to tune in for adventure cartoons Uh, yeah pulp stuff yes Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the other way that you make a world, a campaign world, feel alive, right? One of my big bugbears with, um, n- not not bugbears, but um, bugbears and nuisances. It could be a bugbear. Uh, but it could be a bugbear uh, with, the, um, with the Bethesda games in general. I was going to say Skyrim, Elder Scrolls, but also even Fallout does this, which is everybody stands on the spot or maybe walks around a, a little, you know, 10-foot kind of radius area and does nothing unless you make them do something Um, Mm. uh, to the point where often, like if you go do a quest, which would hypothetically completely change things, the world state doesn't change until you go and talk to someone to tell them that something has happened. Where there is the illusion of a moving world with something. uh, There's been a heavy episode for the Witcher watch that the Witcher two did really well, where you have to make a big decision at one point uh, at the end of the first act of that game. And when you go off and make that decision and come back to see what the other NPCs did, they were doing stuff that whole time. And like the game, the, 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 the world changes, the state changes. Um, so yeah, just basically supporting and agreeing with, with what you said, Sean, um, is, you know, moving. If, if the party have the choice between dealing with this mysterious person who's having bad dreams over here and this wyvern that's terrorizing a town over here, if they investigate the bad dreams, then the wyverns may be, you know, even more dangerous because it's hatched a bunch of eggs. Or if they go deal with the wyvern, then the dream everybody's having the dreams now, and that kind of escalates to make the world feel like it has uh, consequences. The challenge of doing something like this, which I think is very rewarding for the DMs and players if they know about it, is that you have to make sure your players know about it, and you have to do a lot of work on the back end to keep track of it. Mm. Because if the players aren't aware of that, you might as well not be doing it. If it's something that the players can see and like make an informed choice about, or even if they just can get the sense that every week, oh, yeah, our actions do have consequences because we've kind of like, because you as a DM have walked them through the mechanics of it a little bit, whether explicitly or just like narratively speaking, then it, then it has weight, then it has meaning. Otherwise, it's just like, okay, as a DM, you could just make arbitrary decisions every week and kind of BSing to uh, to kind of thread the bridge between that. That was a terrible, thread the bridge. What am I thread talking about? Thread that bridge. Bridge the gap, <laughs> thread the needle. There's a Tory um, if I ever heard one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so 
make sure that when you're doing all the extra effort to make that cool, very sort of agency giving behind the scenes mechanic, uh, that like, you know, you give yourself a moment to pat yourself on the back a little bit and the players like can recognize that because otherwise it's, you know, it's, it's not anything. Um, I would just like to point out that my mother <laughs> has popped up in the <laughs> Twitch chat to tell me that the academic I was thinking of was Hans Robert Yaus, who's a medievalist scholar. Thanks, mum. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dale's mom. Thanks, Dale's mom. Um, I, I, thank you. You're here to keep us classy, Dale, <laughs> bringing up academic scholars and medievalists and stuff. And here we are talking about Witcher for the eighth time in this episode. <laughs> hey, hey, hold on. <laughs> Uh, cool. Well, speaking of episode, I think that is about as much time as we have for speaking this one. Speaking of episode. Um, <laughs> if you want to ask a question. You really threaded that uh, bridge, Ben. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> um, if you want to ask us a question like Callum did, you can hit up podcast at ghostfiregaming.com uh, and I will bring it to the panel or you can comment uh, in the YouTube comments if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, we are live on Twitch every week uh, at 7 p.m. Monday, Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, 9 a.m. Australian uh, Standard Time on Tuesday if you're interested. Uh, so come hang out live. You can ask questions. The chat have been having their own discussions about squirreling, squirreling, uh, that's what I wanted to say was it was a bit of a squirrely um, uh, segue, <laughs> that one was. Anyway, uh, I've been Ben Byrne here as always with Dale Kingsmill, James Hake, Sean Merwin, and we will catch you all again next week. <laughs> When you said bugbear, it immediately made me think. I once had a lecturer who forgot the word um, pet peeve and he was trying to remember it. And he just went, I have a a, a hobgoblin, a, a bet noir, a thing that pisses me off. <laughs> that was-